Hey everybody, Al Norica here with Cast King Fishing and today we're going to continue our discussion of the basics of fly fishing and how to get you started right in a tremendous sport. So what I have in front of me today here uh, are some of the tools that you're going to need. Now you know as fly fishermen I think we carry probably way too many tools, too many flies. Uh, it's really not necessary that you have all these things. You'll see guys out there with big heavy vests and fanny packs and uh, sling packs and all these different things and they're jammed full with all this gear. Uh, it gets heavy, it's kind of hard to find what you really need when you really need it. So I'm going to try to break this down and get it down to the basics, the most important tools uh, that it's going to make fly fishing easy for you and still have the tools that are required to get the job done. So let's kind of go through some of these tools and uh, I think you're going to enjoy this. So to begin with, Let's talk about a nipper. You know, a nipper tool is something you're going to use probably more than almost anything because we're always adding flies or adding leader or tippet material, and you've got, you've got to be able to have a, uh, a very sharp, uh, accurate cutting tool to nip off the tag end of that monofilament or fluorocarbon line uh, after you've attached that fly. So I have a couple different types of nippers here. Uh, this is a smaller size. I like the big one because it fits in my hand very easy. It can be very accurate when I, when I cut that, but uh, it's very comfortable in my hand. So a good nipper tool, you pick the kind that you'd like. It doesn't really matter, but just make sure it's sharp. It can be a, a fingernail clipper. That would work just fine. But there's a lot of clippers that are made specifically for fishing uh, that really work very, very well. These are just two models. I will mention, on this particular model right here, it has something that's uh, pretty convenient, actually. This is actually a nail knot tool. Now, the nail knot tool is going to come in handy if you happen to be using a fly line that doesn't have a loop-to-loop -loop connection uh, at the end of the line. So you're going to have to tie a nail knot uh, from your fly line to your leader. Now, those nail knots can be hard to tie, if you don't have a nail knot tool. So uh, it might be a good idea to look for a nipper that includes a nail knot tool. Uh, if you're using loop-to-loop -loop connections on your fly line, it's not necessary. You can simply have uh, any other style of nipper to be cutting that line. The next item uh, that I find that I use a lot is a forcep. Now, I've brought along two different kinds. This is kind of a, uh, a mini forcep, very small. Uh, this is a little bit longer, as you can see, and it has a curved end. Now, that makes it easier sometimes for removing the hooks from uh, the fish's mouth. A little bit longer, and that curved shape can help. But to be honest, I like something with fairly big loops at the end here, so if I'm wearing gloves, I can get my fingers in easy, and I like the small, tiny little jaws so I can reach in very carefully and remove a fly from a, a fish's mouth. The other thing that I use a uh, forcep for uh, is selecting flies, and I can open up my fly box and very easily reach in with my forcep and pull out the fly and hold it inspect it, make sure it's looking good, and then I can also use it when I'm actually tying my knot. So the forcep is a tool that uh, I use a lot. And what's nice about these is they clip to almost anything. So it just hangs there. It has uh, a little gripper jaws at this end, so when you squeeze it tight, they stay closed, and you push, and they open very easily. So a forcep is something that I think you're going to find that you really need to have. Next up, okay, so let's talk now about fly selection, okay? So I have a lot of different flies in front of me, and, and to be honest, this is only a few of my fly boxes. I think I'm probably one of those guys that carries way too many flies, but depending on what's going on in the water or the, or the river that, or the lake that I'm fishing in, I like to have a pretty good selection of flies. But regardless of how many you carry, I suggest you have a nice plastic box. Um, they keep organized, they don't fall out. This particular one has a waterproof uh, rim all the way around it, it's like a compression gasket, and, and that keeps my flies uh, from getting uh, wet when they're not supposed to be wet, which can cause rust on the hooks inside the box when it's closed up tight. 
So I do like that feature. One other feature I like a lot on these fly boxes is the fact that the bottom is curved. So when I'm reaching in for a very small little fly, like that guy right there, I can easily reach in and slide it up because it has a curved bottom to the box. That makes it a lot easier. Now here's another box that's very, very small, has a flip-up lid like this, and you notice the sides here are also curved, so it makes it very easy to select a fly and actually get out of the box. The ones that have straight edges in the different compartments, uh, I think become very difficult to actually get a fly out of if you're not uh, selecting it with a forcep. So, a fly box or a number of fly boxes, depending on how many flies you want to carry and how you want to organize your flies, uh, this is something you definitely need to have along. Okay, now let's talk about uh, strike indicators. Because a strike indicator uh, is something that really becomes very important if you're fishing those subsurface techniques. Where I'm fishing a nymph fly underneath the surface, close to the bottom, and it's kind of hard to tell if you're getting a strike if you don't have a strike indicator. Uh, the bottom line is this is really nothing more than a bobber for fly fishing, right? A strike indicator will really help you identify small, subtle strikes. Because if this indicator is floating along on the surface of the water and all of a sudden it stops, it hesitates, or maybe it goes all the way down. Boy, it's time to set the hook because that means a fish down towards the bottom has grabbed a hold of your fly and he's either just holding it or he's moving away with it. But that indicator is going to let you know when that happens. Uh, without the indicator, which is straight line nymphing, sometimes you have to wait till you feel it and that fish can actually throw that fly or spit it out before you actually feel the take. But an indicator like this, uh, any one of these styles, and I use them in pretty bright colors, uh, that'll make the difference in you telling when that strike has occurred. Uh, you miss a lot less fish. Now, in order to get some of these subsurface flies down deep, another really important uh, tool that I have is split shot. Now, this contains small little green split shot pieces. Um, they're very tiny, but I can add multiples of these to my fly leader just above my fly, usually around 18 to 24 inches above my fly. And that helps that, that fly sink deeper, stay closer to the bottom, which is typically where those fish are feeding. So, some sort of split shot. It can be very simple, cheap, lead split shot. It can be tin split shot. It can come in a container like this. But one way or another, you should have some split shot so that you can get your flies, subsurface flies, down deeper to where those fish are living and feeding. Now, if you're not fishing subsurface and you're fishing dry flies and you want them to float on the surface of the water, Sometimes as that fly gets wet and the longer we fish, it doesn't float quite as high on the surface. When that occurs, you tend not to get as many strikes. So I carry a small bottle of fly floatant and I would simply open the lid, put just a touch on the wings of my fly and kind of work them in with my finger, being careful not to get any on the leader material itself because I don't want the leader material to float really high and be visible. So be careful you keep it only on the fly itself and that's going to help it float better and you get more strikes. So let's talk about a couple other tools that I think are really important to fly fishing and the first one is sunglasses. You know, when I fly fish, it doesn't matter if it's sunny or cloudy, I wear sunglasses and the first reason is because it's really a safety issue. When we're making those fly casts, that fly is moving past our bodies very close at a high rate of speed. And if a little gust of wind comes up, or maybe we just don't make a perfect cast, and if we happen to get that fly coming back into our eye, that is definitely not a good thing. And by wearing a pair of protective sunglasses, that's going to keep that fly away from our eyes, which is so critical for uh, life in general. The second reason is, and I really encourage you to, when you buy sunglasses, you buy a pair that's polarized. We definitely want to be able to see into the water because a lot of times we're sight fishing. In other words, we actually see a fish into the water before we make a cast. And then we make an actual presentation or a cast directly to an individual fish. And with polarized sunglasses, we have a much better chance of seeing a fish before they see us or before we move on to another location. So a polarized glass.
Now there's one more thing about these that I really appreciate and like. Uh, you know, as I've gotten older, I have a little bit of a hard time seeing up close. And when I'm using tiny little flies and tiny little leaders, trying to put a size 7X through a size 24 fly eye, uh, that's kind of hard with my eyes. So I would have to wear a pair of reader glasses or magnifiers attached to my hat. It's always a pain to take those on and off and flip it up and down and then put my sunglasses back on. So I actually have a pair of sunglasses here. I don't know if you can see this, but they actually have readers built into the bottom of the sunglasses. So I can wear these and have a normal field of view looking around as I'm fishing. But then when I need to work up close and to be able to see things close, I just simply look down through the bottom of the sunglass and I can see very close up, very small things. And I'll tell you, it, it saved me a lot of time and it saved me the hassle of having flip down magnifiers and a second pair of glasses. I just leave them on all the time and I'm always ready to work up close. So polarized sunglasses, safety issue, and magnifiers if you need that on the sunglasses. The last thing I want to talk to you about is a landing net. Now I don't always use a landing net. A lot of times I'll just simply use my forcep, hold my rod tip high, reach down, and pop the fly out to release that fish. Uh, if I don't want to uh, take any risk of uh, hurting that fish in any way, let him swim back and be caught another day. But there are times where it's a big fish or uh, you know, I want to take some pictures or whatever, so I'm going to use a landing net. And a couple things. Uh, this is a fairly small one. I like this kind of oval shape. Uh, this happens to be a very lightweight net. It's made out of carbon fiber. But probably the most important thing here is the net material. This is a, uh, a rubber coated material that is really fish friendly. And what I mean by that is that it doesn't remove the slime and the natural coating on the outside of the fish as the fish is laying in the net. That can actually cause bacteria and uh, that fish can be harmed later on and may not even survive. So we want to handle these fish very gently, especially when we're catch and release fishing. Uh, one little tip I'll mention this while we're talking about that is before I ever handle uh, a fish for a picture or even releasing, I'm going to make sure my hands are wet. You never want to lift a fish with dry hands. So just get your hands wet real quick and that'll help keep that coating on the fish as well. But uh, back to the nets. Uh, a good landing net fish friendly, rubber coated design, whatever size. I mean, you can spend anything from a few dollars to a hundred dollars on a net. Pick one that's in your budget if you want to have that along. And it's a very handy tool, especially if you want to take pictures uh, of that giant fish that hopefully uh, you're all going to catch. So, recapping a little bit, you don't need a ton of different tools. You do need the, the necessities to go out there and have this sport be easy to accomplish uh, and very functional. Uh, these are the most important things. A nipper, forcep, split shot, strike indicator, a box for your flies uh, that's easy to get in and out of, uh, floating to keep your dry flies on the surface, split shot to get it down deep, sunglasses to protect your eyes, and maybe a landing net. So kind of the final thing you need to decide is how you're going to organize all of this gear. Now, you might have a fly vest, maybe a, a fanny pack, a sling pack. There's a lot of different options. I'm going to leave that totally up to you because that's really personal preference. You might want something big or you want something very, very small. Make sure it fits the kind of tools that you're carrying with you uh, and just enjoy it. Uh, don't make it complicated, but find a good pack or something that you're going to be able to put these things in and you're going to have a great day on the water. I hope that we're helping you. We're trying to make this as easy as possible so more people get involved with this incredible sport of fly fishing. Until next time, I'm Al Norka with Cask King, and I hope to see you on the water really soon.